Gautam sir, could you please check your presenting the screen option before we start the session? Uh, yes, let me um, try to share my screen. A very good morning to all the faculty members and a very happy Teachers Day to everyone. I welcome you all to the inaugural of virtual visit on modern physics VVMP 2020 and second keynote speech of International Conference of Research in Science, Engineering and Technology, ICRISET 2020. I request Dr. Indrajit Patel, sir, principal. BVM Engineering College for the inaugural speech. Thank you. Very good morning and Namaskar to all the distinguished teachers and the students on the eve of the birth anniversary of all time great teacher Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, the former president of Government of India as well as a true inspiring academic leader to whom we respect on every 5th of September since last 70 plus years. Friends, I am delighted to be with all of you on the occasion of inaugural session of virtual visit on the various prestigious laboratory in the field of nuclear science, space technology, plasma research, as well as modern physics. And also together with this, the second keynote session of the International Conference on Innovation and Research in Science, Engineering and Technology, ICRISET 2020. We are lucky to have with us a very prominent senior scientist, Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay from NASA to deliver this opening speech as well as the keynote speech on this dual occasion. Friends, we know that in color, we have red, yellow and blue as a fundamental colors 
we have civil mechanical and electrical as a fundamental branch of engineering we have chemistry biology and physics the fundamental of branch of science but today day is of the hybrid science hybrid technology hybrid education and hybrid product whatever we discuss in terms of the blended education blended research blended technology blended applications and what say overall bila vishwakarma mahavidyalay a premier institution of charudra vidyamandal catering quality education since 14 june 1948 the institute founded with a visionary thoughts in a deep vision of the sardar patel team bbm work for the holistic growth of the student community the family of the students the society of the students and nation at large we work with a motto work is worship we work with a vision to produce globally employable innovative engineers with the core values the bbm has a very very prestigious very very dedicated very very excited team of a planet like earth we have ieee student branch we have iist why we have iei we have robotic society of india we have central committee we have wooden women development cell we have nss we have ncc so all these are the planet in the galaxy of billa vishwakarma mahavidyalay it is a unit a family working for the holistic development of the society i am happy to say that team ieee student branch is doing wonderful work since last couple of years to organize the activities to addresses the challenges in the field of engineering science and technology i am proud to say that even during pandemic season our all the faculty members all the professional societies they have demonstrated a very state of art work since 21st of march 1350 plus activities in terms of the seminars webinars faculty development programs some quiz some competitions are taken by our faculties i am happy to say that we have delivered the ideas the thoughts the motivated motivation the technical supports to more than 42000 people across the world during this five months of pandemic due to this covid 2019 so we are committed we are always uh, work with the objective to serve the, the society in each and every endeavors we have converted this corona pandemic to a opportunity for the learning a opportunity to excel a opportunity to share our knowledge to share our experience to connect the researchers to connect the innovators to connect the academic leaders to connect the various prestigious body to the society through various platform like iei ieee csi and many more i am happy to know that during this particular one week we will have a visit to very prestigious prestigious laboratories in field of nuclear science plasma research renewable energy then uh, space craft and many more there will be visit of nasa sun laboratory isro and leading academicians research like dr gautam dr matthew dr ak singh dr steven dr clara miss kathy and dr ligia they are going to deliver the expertise talks in these fields this nuclear society a plasma scientific and science as well as the visit to this modern physics will be of great relevance to support our vision that is learning beyond curriculum we have best practices on every saturday we have various activities in different domains to expose the students beyond curriculum to expose the students beyond college classroom to expose the students beyond college laboratories by way of such expert talks such virtual visit some uh, invited talks some hands on experience peer to peer learning as well as the students counseling so i wish this particular virtual visit week expert talk visit week as well as keynote address a grand success i congratulate the faculty advisor ieee student chapter the chair of ieee students branch and entire core committee of my dear students of ieee students branch who have demonstrated a very professional a very dedicated well disciplined approach throughout this particular two years 
to promote the society more and more towards the human engineering, towards the societal upliftment and the capacity buildings of the students and faculty at large. Once again, I take this opportunity to welcome you all on this digital platform. May God bless all of us for a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for always motivating us towards a holistic development. I request Dr. Jagdish Rathod, sir, faculty advisor, IEEE BVMSB, for the welcome speech. Hello, good morning. On the occasion of virtual visit on modern physics, BVMP, and second day of ICRI set to 2020, myself, Dr. Jagdish M. Rathod, Associate Dean, Associate Professor, Faculty Advisor of IEEE and Convener of our ICRI set. Welcome Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay, sir, Senior Scientist, NASA, person who is from high frequency analysis. So my field is also same. So I am very much delighted to hear the speech of sir. I welcome on behalf of IEEE chapter, BVM and personal behalf, sir. I appreciated your inputs, which is given in a previous meetings. It is about your micro theory techniques chapter at BVM. As we have a LARC, which is a research center about the electromagnetics and antenna. We will take your help in future also, sir. And thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I now call Dr. Darshan Dalwadi, sir. Branch Counselor, IEEE BVMSB, for the opening remarks. Uh, very good morning to the expert speaker and all the students and the faculty members. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. As we start this glorious event, I would like to thank Chairman CVM, Engineer Bhikkhu Bhai Patel, sir, and entire CVM team for providing the support to manage the event through MS, uh, MS Team platform. I would like to thank Principal Dr. Indrajit Patel, sir, and Dr. Jagdish Rathod, sir, for guiding the team to put together an event that is truly one of a kind and unlike any other that we have put together. We hope you will enjoy all the sessions planned under this event till 13 September. This event theme is delivering a practical experience and a knowledge to en enrich the students and academic professionals alike with topics based on modern physics like nuclear and plasma sciences, space technologies, and re uh, renewable energy, etc. And the experts who will share their knowledge are among the best in their fields. I would like to thank them all for sparing their valuable time during these trying times and imparting knowledge with students from all around the world. To give a quick overview, of our experts will deliver their experiments and teach the registrants regarding various fascinating tracks like uh, terahertz radar technology, James Webb space telescope, plasma-based technology for future uh, particle colliders, AstroSat, India's first mission on space, wind energy system at Denmark Technical University. I would like to thank organizing team IEEE BVM and IEEE Nuclear and Plasma Science Society, which provide the overall support regarding virtual visits on modern physics 2020 from uh, 5th September to 13th September 2020. I would also thank various international and national organizations like NASA USA, ISRO Ahmedabad, Sun Geneva, Denmark Technical University, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. We will have today uh, Gautam Chattopadhyay sir uh, today describe, uh, describing the terahertz radar technology and various aspects pertaining to it. Now I would like to invite Dr. Tanmay Pawa sir for introducing our speaker for today, sir. Okay. Thank you, Darshan, for giving me an opportunity to introduce uh, such a high stature scientist, uh, Dr. Uh, Gautam Chattopadhyay, senior scientist from NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. His brief uh, introduction uh, uh, is. Uh, Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay is a senior scientist at the NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, a visiting professor at the Division of Physics, Mathematics and Astronomy at the California Institute of Technology, Pasadena, USA, a Bell Distinguished Visiting Chair for 
professor at the in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India, and an adjunct professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, India. He received the PhD degree in electrical engineering from the California Institute of Technology, also famous as Caltech, Pasadena in 2000. He is a fellow of IEEE USA and IET India and IEEE Distinguished Lecturer. His research interests include microwave, millimeter wave and terahertz receiver systems and radars and development of space instruments for the search for life beyond Earth. He has more than 350 publications in international journals and conferences and holds more than 20 patents. He also received more than 35 NASA Technical Achievement and New Technology Invention Awards. He received the IEEE Region 6 Engineer of Year Award in 2018, Distinguished Alumni Award from the Indian Institute of Engineering, Science and Technology, India in 2017. He was the recipient of Best Journal Paper Award in 2020 and 2013 by IEEE Transactions on Terahertz Science and Technology. Best Paper Award for Antenna Design and Applications at the European Antennas and Propagation Conference in 2017. And IET Professor S. N. Mitra Memorial Award in 2014. So this is his brief uh, introduction and I welcome you sir on this occasion uh, to deliver keynote speech. Uh, thank you very much sir. Thank you everyone um, and good morning to all of you. Before I start, before I start showing my slides, I just first want to wish everyone, uh, the teachers and the students a very happy Teachers Day. You know, today is very important day for all the all the teachers. And for me, I also want to you know congratulate the students because for me, the students are the best teachers for people like us. Because when we talk to students and we learn so much because they are young, they are not afraid. So they ask the kind of questions uh, that make us think in a different way. Because sometimes I believe that experience kind of pollute us into to think in certain ways. The students are the new blood. They come up with new ideas and new questions. So that's why it's very important that we acknowledge the students on Teachers Day. Um, so with that, and again, I'm extremely happy to be here. And I really want to congratulate all the students for uh, organizing such an uh, such an event. I have been contacted on LinkedIn by some of the students and they are extremely active. I, I, I'll tell you, so I am really proud of what uh, you all are doing. So that also reflects on all the professors who are here and the principal. Thank you for your patience, sir. You may continue. No problem. Now. All Thank right. You. Okay. So let me uh, go back to my slide and then, okay. Uh, it's full screen now. So again, so what I was saying that for every mission that we do, so is it going, everything going fine? You yes, all can sir. hear me, right? Okay. Yes, so uh, what I was saying that, you know, when we are plan for a mission, first thing that we start with is a science question that, okay, let's say one of the science question we want to answer that are we alone in this universe? In this universe, on, does life exist anywhere else outside our planet Earth? If you are trying to answer that question, the next the, the thing will be that, what kind of measurements that we can do to answer that question? And then it will be okay, then what kind of instrument we'll have to build to make that measurement that will answer that science question. So everything is related in a science way. So I will give you a little bit of example uh, before I go to the terahertz radar that what exactly we do in NASA. So before I start, I want to acknowledge 
uh, my team. Uh, the name of my team is Submillimeter of Advanced Technology. So we have about 24 people uh, in, in that team and you will see looking at their faces that they actually come from all over the world. So that is one of the uh, main feature of NASA. What make what uh, you know people ask me what makes NASA great and I tell them that it is the diversity of the talent it's the diversity of the people because when you are getting the best and the brightest from all over the world coming together that's when good things happen so I have been so lucky to really work with people my colleagues who are the best in this world whatever they do so that is very, very, uh, you know, uh, I'm very, uh, get humbled by that fact that I got this opportunity. And as a little bit about NASA and JPL, uh, as you all know that NASA actually has quite a few different centers. One of the person who will be talking to you is only from uh, here, Goddard Space Flight Center, that is in Maryland, uh, Greenbelt. NASA headquarters is in Washington, DC, and I am here on the West Coast Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Pasadena, California. And what we do is actually we do all the robotic missions for NASA. So all the, the rover that is going on, on its way to Mars right now, you all know that the Perseverance rover we launched on in late July. Uh, so that was developed here, built here. So all the robot, most of the robotic missions are designed and developed in our lab. And then you know each center has their own expertise. So before I start, I want to show you this that about this is the history of our universe. We all know that the uh, universe started with the Big Bang. So this is the Big Bang theory. This is not the Big Bang theory that you watch on your TV, the Sheldon Cooper and others. This is the real Big Bang theory. And so what we do most often is that actually we study this universe in electromagnetic spectrum. So to do that, it turns out that the first light that came out of this universe is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang happened. Before that, what the, it used to be, the universe used to be a very big hot plasma and the light used to scatter in such a way that no light could escape. So the first light that escaped is called the cosmic microwave background signal. And that was detected by two uh, uh, scientists. Uh, they are uh, Wilson and Penzias. And what they're doing is uh, they were, they used to work for AT&T Bell Labs. And they're doing some millimeter wave communication experiments. And while doing the experiment, they found that they were getting some extra noise in their receiver. And you know, for when we find extra noise, then what do we do as a student? Most often we take, oh, we cannot really explain from where this extra noise is coming. Then we say it must be the experimental error. And then we make the error a little larger, but they were much smarter than I am at least. So what they did, they went and talked to a physicist and the physicist told them that what I, he thought was the first light of this universe. And they went and they did some more experiments and lo and behold, Yes, that was the first light. They detected the first light of this universe. And for that, they went on to win the Nobel Prize. So next time you are in your lab, you are doing some experiment and you cannot expe uh, explain some results, do not think that that is a experimental error. You might uh, win the Nobel Prize, you never know. So as you all know that we as NASA, we actually keep going back to Mars to explore, right? Uh, and, uh, but before that, I, the question I was asking that are we alone in this universe? So I am asked uh, this question quite often that are we really alone in this universe? So I want to tell you all that we have not found life anywhere else uh, on our universe other than our planet Earth. So let's set that stage very, uh, you know, uh, you know, you will read a lot of stuff on the internet. You will uh, see a lot of stuff on the YouTube, but don't believe them because we have not found any aliens. We have not found any form of life anywhere other than our own planet. But can life really exist? What do I think people ask me? And I actually believe that life must be existing somewhere else as well. Why do I believe that? 
you can do some back of the envelope calculations and then you can see what, what is the probability. If you look in the sky, you'll find that there are about 100 billion stars in our own galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy that we see in the sky, when you look up, there are about 100 billion stars. That is uh, 11 zeros after one. And in this universe, we have about 100 billion galaxies. If you do your math, you know that there are about 10 to the power 22 stars in this universe. And then we are finding increasingly that most of these stars, they have not one, multiple planets going around them. Then if you think, you know, do your calculation and think that what is the probability that amongst all these trillions and trillions of stars and, you know, those many planets, what is the probability that there is one planet where the conditions are such that life can exist? And I, you know, you will get an answer of a, you know, non-zero probability, a finite pro uh, probability, which means that it's, we have to look for it. We have started looking for that recently, and we are finding exoplanets, the planets that is around other stars, they're called exoplanets, we have found more than 4,000 exoplanets so far, but we have looked only in our own galaxy, in a very narrow region of our own galaxy. So we have just started, uh, you know, exploring this area, and we are all we have already found quite a few planetary bodies, which uh, are which we, what we call the habitable zone. That means where the conditions such are such, the temperature is such that on the planet that water can exist in liquid form on the surface of those planets. So we are very excited, but problem is we cannot really go there because they are far, far away. You know, one of the uh, planetary system that we found recently is about four light years away. You know, four light years is a huge distance. It will take with current day technology is about 40 million years to go there. So we cannot really go there with current day technology in our lifetime. So we'll have to find other ways to explore. And you also all know that we keep going back to Mars. Why we do that? Why the, right now three different countries have sent uh, the mission to Mars. China launched first, uh, then UAE launched the first uh, uh, of the Mars mission, and then US, NASA also launched another Mars rover mission. So why are you doing that? The reason is that Mars resembles Earth in many ways, especially in the early part of Mars history. The question is, was Mars ever a habitable planet? Or does life exist on Mars to be? The main Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Now we can. OK, so, so I lost you all suddenly. Uh, anyway, so what I was saying, I'm really sorry because I don't know what happened. Suddenly um, uh, I sh it showed that you all I lost you. But anyway, so what I was saying that we keep going back to Mars uh, because this mission the Perseverance mission is also one of the main objective of that mission is to find out was, was there life on Mars at any point of time. And if you are, if I show this picture, you know, this is the rainy season in India now. And if I tell you that this picture is from one of the roads in Calcutta uh, during the monsoon season, you might believe me, uh, but not. This is actually a picture from Mars. And if you look carefully, in this picture, what you are seeing is that we get this kind of terrain only when there is flowing water. 
so which means that at one point of at some point of in time in mars there's flowing water but if we go there today we do not see any flowing water the question is what happened where did that water go can it happen to our own planet so these are the big question that we are trying to answer by going to mars trying to understand what happened there and you know that with time we you know we had launched spirit and opportunity 2003 the pathfinder is 1996 curiosity 2011 and now we are sending uh, the in uh, uh, the new rover mars 2020 rover uh, perseverance so you can see that sizes of the rovers has gone up in every every time we send a new one and this is the latest one uh, mars 2020 we named it perseverance you can see that there are a lot of different instruments on this that it uh, is going to do measurements on mars try to answer those questions there are a lot of cameras there are a lot of uh, high resolution spectrometer and there is an imager so all different kinds of instruments are are there on that and this is the actual picture of a uh, perseverance rover that was uh, that lo got launched in july 30th and this one was taken just before it left our lab to be integrated uh, in, in florida so uh, you can see that how it looks this is a real life picture and this i want to show this that you know this picture actually was taken uh, by mars rover curiosity and then uh, in, uh, what you are seeing here is that this dot is actually planet earth and if you expand it you can see earth and the moon and why it's important because this was the first time our planet was pictured from the surface of another planet it's very very exciting and i show this to students uh, because you know as students sometimes we think that we know a lot as human being. We are the smartest, we are the greatest, we know everything. But I want you all to think about this picture when you think about that you are the best, you are the smartest, because in big scheme of thing, we are just a dot in the sky. And next time you think about that, hopefully that will ground you. And you know, for electrical engineers, grounding is very, very important. And I also want to show there is a, we, uh, you know, Curiosity did not have very high uh, resolution cam, uh, video camera that could take pictures. But what we did, we actually captured for the first time, uh, you know, Mars has multiple moons. We have only one moon. So it, there is a, there was an eclipse of two moons of Mars and it was captured by uh, this, uh, uh, you know, Mars rover Curiosity, you can see the bigger moon is going in front of the smaller moon. And since it, we did not have a video camera, we actually took a lot of still pictures and put them together as a video. So that's what it shows. So it is very, very exciting. Can just think about it. Suppose you are working in the lab and building an instrument that goes to Mars and sends you back this kind of pictures. So that is the most exciting thing in one's life. So at least in my life, when I work on some of this stuff and it goes to space and say, you know, send some data, makes new discoveries, that is uh, in the most most exhilarating. And uh, you know, a lot of young students are watching this, so all of you take selfies, right? So Mars rover Curiosity also like a teenager, so it took a selfie of itself and sent sent us back. What you don't see is the arm where the camera was mounted for the uh, for the selfies because we just you know uh, took that one out, shop photoshopped it out so that it looks cool. Uh, uh, but this is a real picture; it is a real selfie. So it's showing that you know uh, uh, you know the, how the terrain looks like. It's a lot of exciting thing that we can do there when you go to Mars. So one of the thing that we are also doing is search of water because as I mentioned, we are looking for the sign of life. And when you are looking for life, we look for life that we know about. That is the carbon based life, right? For that life to exist, we need water and oxygen. And you know that we found that is, the, is there enough water out there? So we found actually one instrument that Herschel Hi-Fi, I actually built uh, a lot of parts of this instrument. So it did some measurement. We, are, we found that in you know, star-forming regions of the like our sun-like star, young star, 
where the water molecules are moving as bullets at 200,000 kilometers per hour from the stars. And if you fire a, a bullet from AK-47 rifle, the speed of that bullet is about 2,500 kilometers per hour, which means these water molecules are traveling 80 times faster than a bullet. But, you know, if something travels that fast, then it tries to, you know, heat up. But, you know, conditions are such that it finds a way to combine and it generates huge amount of water. How much? About 100 million times the total amount of water in Amazon River is created per second in one of the stars, which means that we have a lot of water out there, enough water out there. And, you know, that in a way this universe is flooded with water. So there is water out there. So is there life? And another thing about water is very interesting that when our Earth was formed, uh, there was no water. And scientists believe that, you know, comets brought water to Earth. But if I tell you comets brought water to Earth, you are not going to believe me, right? You are going to say, what is the proof? The proof is that's why, as we said, that if we want to make the science, answer the science question, that did water, comets brought water to Earth, next question you have to ask, what kind of measurements we can do? What kind of instruments we can build? So one of the measurements we can do is that it turns out what there are different kinds of water. The water that we drink every day is H216O. You know, oxygen has different isotopes. So the 16th isotope is the most stable isotope. And the, most of the water is actually H216O. But there are other kinds of water, H217O, H218O, HDO, one hydrogen, one deuterium, and one oxygen. So if you take the ratio of these different abundances of different waters, and it turns out the ratio matches very close to the comets one particular kind of comet called Jupiter family comets. But we may or did only about 10 such measurements. So it is not answered, it's still not really settled that really comet brought uh, water to Earth. Currently, I am actually building an instrument, uh, a planetary instrument that will go to a comet, is a very, in a uh, CubeSat, is a shoebox size satellite and is very low power and low mass instrument at terahertz frequencies that will be able to answer the, this question. So uh, you know, we made a lot of progress in that. And another thing that when we talk about you know, life in, in this universe, in other side, is there life in our own solar system in other places other than Earth? One of the possibilities may be Enceladus. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. And what you see is again from the Herschel Observatory, we found that water is gushing out from Enceladus. And this is a very cold planetary body. This is a moon of Saturn, as I said, and it's a very cold place, but water is coming out, which means that there has to be a source of heat inside. Otherwise, why water is, will be in the liquid form? And when it's coming out, the question is, if there is a heat, there is a source of water, what else is coming out in this water? Is there any organic materials? Is there any life material in that? So to answer that question, we are actually planning a mission to go to Enceladus to find out what else is there in that. Is Enceladus holding life inside? So that will be a very, very exciting discovery if we can do that. Another place that we believe there is a very high chance of finding some kind of life is Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. And then what it is is very interesting because we scientists found out that Europa, though it is a very cold body, but there's a thick shell of ice, but underneath that, there's a liquid water ocean. That how do you know? Because we did all the measurements here. We did a lot of gravity measurements and all we can find out. We believe that this is kind of the structure of that uh, planet. There is liquid water ocean and there is a mantle like our own art that produces heat. And there is ice shell on top. And this thickness of this ice shell is about 15 kilometers to 100 kilometers. So the question is, is there life in this liquid water ocean? So if I come and ask you that when NASA is planning a mission to go to Europa, then what kind of instrument you, should, you are going to send to find out if there is life inside? As a student, right, this question is posed to us that what kind of instrument we should send? The obvious answer is that we, can, we should send a drill. We should drill a hole, take a bucket of water and see what is there. Is there any life? 
problem is uh, that you know drilling a hole in a Europa this so far away is not easy 15 kilometer hole right and the reason is that we do not have a lot of power available for this mission total amount of power this it takes about seven years to go to Europa and total amount of power DC power that we have in this mission about four, 300 to 400 watts total three to four light bulbs how can you drill a hole of 15 kilometers through ice with you using 400 watts of power you cannot really do that so we have to find out other ways and it turns out that you know there are a lot of cracks in this ice and water and actually seeps out all the way to the top and since it's very cold it freezes however Europa is close to Jupiter and Jupiter has very high magnetic field that actually produces a lot of uh, radiation and the radiation you know sp sputters the material from the surface to in the atmosphere so we are planning an instrument developing an instrument to look you know high resolution spectrometer at terahertz frequencies to see is there any all organic molecules coming out from there if organics does not necessarily mean life but that is actually a required condition so that's what we are uh, you know looking into that and for that we are actually doing a lot of technology development you know because and then to answer those science questions, you have to develop technology. One of the things that we did, we actually uh, something called Marco. That was the first CubeSat. These are shoebox size. The size of this satellite is about 30 centimeter by 20 centimeter by 10 centimeter. Just you can think of is a shoebox size satellite. And this was used for the last Mars mission because when you go to Mars for about seven to eight minutes, we do not have any communication with our spacecraft because there is no direct link to Earth. So what we did is actually launch the small two satellites with the main mission. And as this, uh, you know, the spacecraft going to the surface of Mars, then it communicates with these two small satellites and this, this two small satellites talks back directly to Earth, giving us the status of what is going on. So others, recently we developed a new technology on a CubeSat, we call it it's a radar on a CubeSat, we call it a rain cube. So what it does is, uh, if you play this one, so what it is, that is a 50 centimeter antenna that is stuck, you know, you know, packed into a very small volume. And that's what it does, it opens up and makes it, we need large antennas to do this measurement. So this is a very, very innovative idea that we actually did uh, recently. And then the, a lot of you work on antennas. You can see when the antenna is ready. This is how it, you know, uh, uh, you know, deploys. I'll show a sh uh, you know, short video showing that how actually the antenna is deployed. You can see we just see the spring loaded. So we just press release the pin and then this antenna deployed. This is a mesh antenna, the parabolic mesh antenna. And it has a sub reflector. And then this also deploys. So that's how this antenna works. So idea is that how can you pack a large antenna in a very small volume? And that's what we did. Actually, this is taking uh, data right now and this is really working well. So we'll have to come up with new ideas, new innovative ideas. One of the theme that at the beginning uh, you know, uh, someone is talking about that, you know, idea of this innovation. So innovation is the key that we will have to come up with new ideas to solve all these problems. And we, one of the things that we are doing again, we are making the you know, new kinds of antenna that goes on the side wall. This is I call it Fakir bed antenna. If you look at this, these are actually metal pins. All these small, small stuff, they're metal pins. Fakir, we all know in Indian term, that means saint. And the, the Indian saints, they used to sleep on bed of nails. So I, uh, you know, term these antennas as a uh, fakir bed antenna because they are all small nails sticking out, all metal, but very thin. Uh, and then it goes on the side wall of this uh, spacecraft and that becomes an antenna. Uh, what I'm showing here is actually I built one at 300 gigahertz. I also made at 35 gigahertz. So they're working really well. So again, you know, to come up with these new ideas, new uh, instrument ideas, uh, and innovation is the key. 
So I was telling you that we are actually building an instrument to go to a comet. So this is the instrument that it looks like that will go to a comet and do the measurement. So this is a very, very small instrument. You can see here all these different innovations that we did. And that is, uh, you know, we are also developing SOCs, that is CMOS system on a chip and synthesizers to make an instrument that is very, very low power and low mass. So that is uh, one of the key for any planetary expl exploration. So that was, you know, the science aspect that I thought that I'll give you a little bit of background about. And then we'll talk about the radar and imaging radar. So we actually developed a terahertz imaging radar. So in any time, if you have gone through a, a airport, you know, this is what you feel like, right? People that uh, airport security always pats you down and trying to find out, are you carrying anything on your body? The question is, if you're a really bad person, and then if someone has to pat you down like this, that will be too late, right? You can actually carry a bomb with you or, you know, some kind of contraband on you. So the question that we were asked by Department of Homeland Security is that, can you really make a system that can image a person from about, let's say, 50 meter distance and see what they're hiding under their clothes? You know, is, is there a gun or a bomb or things like that? So they came to us and then we already had developed some terahertz technology for NASA space missions. Then we said, OK, we can look into that. And before you think that what business NASA has looking through people's clothes, let me assure you that we are not in that business. We are actually developing these terahertz radars for science applications. You know, we are actually currently build it, building a terahertz radar for Mars to find out how much water is there on Mars. So and a lot of other stuff. So this is a side thing that de we developed from our whatever we had developed for NASA. And we developed something called terahertz FMCW radar. It is called frequency modulated continuous wave radar. I'll explain a little bit uh, how it works because most of the radar that we know are pulse radar. So what happens, we transmit a pulse and then the pulse goes, it hits the target and the return signal comes back. And from there, you can find out how far that object is and you can actually image that object. Uh, from from these kind of techniques. But at terahertz frequencies, we do not have a lot of power available. So we cannot really make a pulse radar. So what we build a FMCW radar. So here, instead of sending a pulse, we actually send a signal that changes in frequency with time. This is a red one. And then the return signal is the blue one. And with that, we'll be able to actually uh, make an image of something. So in a way, you know, when we, if we can take a, uh, a laser pointer and if you point it on the wall and what you can do with that you can actually measure the distance right so that time it takes for the laser to go and hit the wall and come back will tell you how far that wall is so we are exactly doing the same thing what we are doing is we are electronically patting basically we are trying to find out the contours of that uh, that person and trying to see if there is anything that is hidden and one of the good thing of terahertz actually it penetrates clothes it goes through clothes so we'll be able to make an image so we actually build a, uh, a 675 gigahertz radar this is a one meter dish and this is in our lab that we when you first put it together there is a paper by myself and my uh, uh, you know colleague ken cooper uh, that shows all the details of this radar so this is where uh, my colleague ken he uh, we bought a non got a non working gun in the lab and he was hiding this gun under his shirt. And if you look at normal imaging system that people do on the intensity only image on the left bottom, you cannot really see anything. But if you look at the terahertz radar, because what the radar does, it actually feels the contour of that. So if you look at the first image on top, you can see that he's hiding something under his shirt. And if you do the electronically strip his shirt off, then you can see that he's holding a gun there. So he's standing uh, quite far off distance. So from far off, you can actually take someone's clothes away 
uh, off and see what they're hiding. So, of course, as you might imagine, there's some privacy issues because we see too much that we should not see so that we can actually blur some part of the image to, uh, you know, to address that, that privacy issues. But it, it, it works. This works really well. Here again, Ken is actually hiding a mock, uh, you know, pipe, uh, you know, uh, this suicide bomb and then wearing a thick jacket on top of him. But you can still see this false color image that you can see that he's actually hiding something. So in that we, I'll show you a short video. So here what, it need not be metal that you, need, you are hiding. So it, if it has some size, some kind of you know volume, then you'll be able to see. Here, uh, my colleague Ken is, uh, there is three one inch PVC pipes that is strapped together on his body and hiding it under his jacket. And he's actually standing almost about 40 meter distance. So far off distance. And what you will see here is the false color image of what of, of the radar. And also we have a video camera there. You can see his image. And on your left bottom screen, you will see the 3D rendition of that radar image. So uh, you can see here that he's standing here. This is a one hertz image. You can see that, you know, clearly see that something is hidden. And on this, you can see the contour. You can see his muscles even through all these thick clothes. So that's how it works. And uh, this is bloody because one hurt. This is not a video rate image. And when he removes his jacket, you'll be able to see that not much of a difference with or without the jacket here. Just watch and see here, more or less the same. And when he actually stands aside, then you can see this is what he was hiding. So this is a very powerful uh, instrument that we have built with that you'll be able to actually see if someone is hiding some kind of, uh, you know, uh, contraband on them. And then, you know, the Department of Homeland Security came to us and said, OK, uh, that's great. But can you, you know, make this one miniaturized and make it much smaller and put it in a van? So we made it somewhat smaller. This is actually uh, a half a meter diameter system. And then this again, uh, this is a, a 340 gigahertz system that we built and what uh, uh, sorry, uh, 675 gigahertz. And then you can see, I will show you a, uh, um, you know, f image from the van. So this is the van that is standing there and we have a mannequin and it was hiding something under its jacket. And if you look at the video in image, you can see here very clearly that and also on the left screen, you can see the 3D. You can turn it around. You can see here. You know what is the thickness of that? You can rotate it around and see what that mannequin is hiding. So this is a very, very useful tool that came out of the NASA technology. And, uh, uh, you know, Department of Homeland Security is now plan is to deploy it. You know, uh, people when people are coming in to the airport, uh, they will put some of them and try to able to see if someone is hiding anything before they can reach uh, the airport itself. So I will end with something slightly different. I, I have two more slides. I'll talk about them is that you all know that this Mars um, last latest Mars mission, Mars 2020, the Perseverance radar has a helicopter on that. It's called Ingenuity helicopter and you might think that what is the big deal about having a helicopter uh, on Mars, right? So the big deal about the helicopter is that it is very, very difficult for a helicopter to fly on Mars because Mars atmosphere is so much lighter compared to our own planet. So if you when the, you have a helicopter here, the, the blade, the, root, the RPM of the blade is of the order of, you know, a 400 to 600 RPM revolution per minute. But because of the lighter atmosphere on Mars, the blade speed has to be about 2,600 to about 3,000 RPM. That is a huge challenge on a very small structure. It cannot be very big because it needs power. And if it is bigger, then it needs larger power, then you, it won't be able to fly. 
So it has to be very you know, low mass. Total mass of the helicopter is about 1.5 kilograms and it has about 220 watts of solar cell power. And then what we uh, did is actually went ahead and made it work. So one of the problem was that this helicopter has a lot of sensors. When it goes around, it actually idea is that it will be on the rover, mounted on the rover, and it takes off, it goes around, it actually takes pictures and collects data and sends that data back to the rover. Well, one of the problem is it takes about seven to eight minutes for signal to reach from Earth to Mars. So we cannot really drive the rover, sit, rover sitting here. What we do is we actually up, upload the path where it needs to go. And it has obstacle avoidance. It is the most expensive, you know, autonomous vehicle, you know, that self-driving car. Uh, however, we'll have to upload everything beforehand. So, uh, but we have to decide beforehand where it needs to go. But in these, the helicopter will go around and see what is going on and send the data back to the rover. And then the rover will decide, oh, maybe that part is interesting. We should go there. So that's the exciting part of this uh, one. And that's actually working. It worked really well on in the lab. So I, we hope this is a technology demo. So we hope that when it reaches on Mars, in February 2021, this helicopter will take off. We'll send the data back. And this is the actual picture of the helicopter. It was just before it was mounted on the Perseverance rover. And the name of the helicopter, Ingenuity. And we hope that it's going to work well. And so with that, I will actually end my talk. And I will open it up for questions. So let me uh, find a way to stop sharing my screen. So any questions? I request the moderators to ask the question one by one. OK, am I audible perfectly? Yes, I can hear you. Hello, sir. Good morning. Uh, I am Dhruv Poker, moderator for today. So yes. our first question. Is, is there any device that help us to see terahertz waves? Terahertz waves. Terahertz wave, you cannot really see it, right? Because it's not an optical wave. So it is like you know, when you are looking at, let's say, kilohertz or, uh, or uh, you know, megahertz or gigahertz, you can see the trace of that on an oscilloscope. But there is no, no oscilloscope that works at this frequency. So in that way, we cannot really see it but you, you can measure it. Hello, good morning, sir. Yes. Sir, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so the question is uh, from Nisar Patel, uh, what exactly are terahertz frequencies best suited for and how demanding are they to produce, control, apply and otherwise manipulate? Oh, yes, so it's a very good question. You know, terahertz is very important because I know for science, terahertz has been used for a long time. And uh, because of the radio astronomy, if we find that if you just take a, uh, a perfect detector that can detect from DC all the way to, you know, uh, you know megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz, gamma rays, and X rays, if you take it out, you will find the majority of the uh, energy that is coming out in this universe actually peaks in the, in, the, in the terahertz band. So if you want to know how stars and galaxies are formed, you'll have to study them in, at terahertz frequencies. On top of that, in the commercial side, you know, terahertz, why people are very much interested in terahertz because of the higher bandwidth that it can provide. You know, terahertz gets absorbed by atmosphere. So that is one of the challenge, however, if you know that 5G is coming and then the 6G will come, but in the back hall, in the sense that when the, in the tower, the amount of data that you'll have to actually transfer is huge. And you cannot really do that in, in, in existing uh, technologies with gigahertz or uh, megahertz or gigahertz. So people are looking at terahertz frequencies. Now we already have established, shown that 220 gigahertz terahertz are into line of sight communication it's very powerful. And then people are looking at even 600 gigahertz. And I showed you about the imaging capability of terahertz. So this is, the, that's how these are the applications. 
And in terms of how you can actually manipulate, yes, you can do manipulate terahertz frequency exactly the same way you actually manipulate your lower frequencies, say gigahertz. Only thing is the technology that you use at lower frequencies, like let's say micro strip and ten micro strips or uh, you know strip lines, those are very lossy at terahertz frequency. So at terahertz frequencies, we mostly use waveguides as you know your transmission lines. And, the, and we have devices, the same kind of short diodes, transistors we have available uh, at terahertz frequencies. And that's how we manipulate them. You, mod you can modulate them, you can manipulate them. Okay. Uh, so the question from Tej Delwadi, there are system harmful for human body or uh, uh, answer is no. Uh, the reason is terahertz is non-ionizing. So when you go uh, and take your X-ray, that is X-ray X-ray that you are ionizing. Basically, it ionizes your all the molecules that is there inside your body. But terahertz is non-ionizing. On top of that, you know terahertz is absorbed by water. So we, we I, as I said, our, you know our body, human body, is mostly of water. Huge amount of human body is water, and then so basically it cannot penetrate your. Uh, it cannot go too much inside your skin. As a result, it cannot damage, and even if it could, it cannot damage your organs. So, uh, as I said, it's not non-ionizing, so there is no, um, you know, uh, effect on human beings. Sir, I'm Dr. Amit Trivedi, uh, Professor Head and Dean of Production Engineering Program at BVM Engineering College. Mm -hmm. Sir, we are trying to work uh, a small project along with me. I have Kushbu Patel also from uh, US, which she has recently post-graduated. On the mm -hmm. bylines of Indian roads, we have a lot of plastics rooming around. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to put a small quadrocopter, which would lift these plastics on the edges of the roads of highways or maybe the streetways. And we are trying to clear the muck because... Uh, you know, Swachta Abhiyan of India is on its way. Can we be benefited by the technology which we have developed? Because we are trying to run multiple small quadracopters in parlance and in parallel so that mm -hmm. they can lift this muck, store it, and then deposit at one place. And mm -hmm. we want to make it, uh, you know, more a feature recognized system because it will be operated by illiterate people. Mm -hmm. So just by giving features, these quadrocopters will move, go up, go down. The only challenge here which we are facing is that as most of the plastic is grounded on ground and mm -hmm. as the quadrocopter comes down, there is a lot of dust which mm -hmm. sprinkles up. That's and right. to lift it is a real challenge then because uh, the moment the, the blades start uh, putting air, the plastic runs here and there. That's and uh, this can be put in all panchayats, all district level headquarters, and all metro cities to clear the muck with uh, quadrocopters being operative by, uh, you know, low graded people of understanding. Mm -hmm. So can we can we have some components of this uh, helicopter which you have put in Mars to human use for cleaning India? Yes, so uh, it's a very good question. And again, as you meant, clearly mentioned, the challenges are that you'll have to come low. Otherwise, yeah. how do you capture them, right? Yeah, because yeah. To capture, otherwise, you have to really use very long arm uh, yeah. uh, with something to, to pick it up. So one thing is about you can image them to where the uh, all these plastics are. That is uh, that you can do. So can content. we use your imaging technique? That's what I'm asking. That, that's that's right. I was coming to that. You can actually do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And the advantage is that uh, you mentioned about dust because optical and infrared, they they obs they get obscured by dust. Right? Yeah. Because that's a big uh, challenge. Whenever there is a dust flares up, uh, you cannot really see what is there underneath. Yeah. And but that is not the case for high high millimeter wave and terahertz frequencies. So those at those frequencies, and luckily we have a moving flying object because the plastic fly here and there with a low wind velocity. That's that's correct. That's correct. So, but thing is that when it's flying around, you'll be able to image, but where it lands, then you'll have to, you know, how do you capture those? You know, that's uh, you know, challenge is not just the identifying them. Challenge yeah. will be, you know, how how to pick them up, 
right? Uh, uh, so because in India there are six trillion uh, kgs of you know plastic moving just on the bylines of the roads. Yeah, that's a huge. It's problem. a very absolutely huge plastic huge. moving. Yeah, that's absolutely huge problem. So, so I would like to connect with you, sir, as regards to the imaging mm -hmm. and as regards to the tracking, if you permit me so. Uh, sure. With the group Absolutely. which we are yeah. working. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I'm Dr. Amit Trivedi, sir. Mm. Absolutely. Hello, Thank sir. you, sir. Sir, the next question is from Rikita. Uh, what is the story behind you joining NASA and why did you choose to join NASA instead of being a part of Indian Space? Instead of being part of? Oh, okay. Part of ISRO because ISRO did not offer me a job. That's why I am not in ISRO. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I would have loved to uh, work in ISRO. But okay. So uh, jokes aside, uh, how I came here is that actually I have been uh, for like many uh, uh, people around the globe. I was really fascinated uh, by NASA when I was a kid. I grew up in outskirts of Calcutta in, in kind of, you know, we were not very well off. We I grew up in a very uh, low uh, economic uh, background and then, uh, but I used to dream big, you know, I used to think that, okay, I, I, I one day maybe I'll go to NASA or I go to, you know, Caltech, California Institute of Technology. I used to hear about uh, people like, you know, Richard Feynman, who used to work, uh, teach at Caltech. Uh, he's a very, very fam famous physicist. So I, I used to dream, and then once I went to um, uh, to undergraduate is Bengal Engineering College, that is under Calcutta University. That is the second oldest engineering college in India, and it is now called IIEST, Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology. And uh, that one, I went there, did my uh, engineering degree, but I had to take up a job uh, because of the financial conditions. I took up a job at TIFR. I, I was lucky to get a job at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. They were building the radio telescope in Pune. It's called GMRT, Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. And so there I met Professor Giant Nalikar and Professor Gobind Swarup. They are very famous astrophysicists uh, in India. And then I really learned a lot. My eyes opened up, you know, when I uh, uh, saw how things work in the renowned institutions in India. And then I wanted to uh, do my higher studies. So I applied uh, for my master's. I came to University of Virginia to do my master's. And then I applied for my PhD and I got really lucky uh, to get admission at Caltech, California Institute of Technology. And Caltech is a very small university. It has only 2000 students total of that. 900 undergraduate students and about 1100 are, you know masters and phd students uh, and then uh, here but caltech has produced 42 nobel laureates this is such a small place but it produced 42 nobel laureates and when i was there you know some the lot of nobel laureates used to walk by me and i, I used to pinch myself that am i really dreaming and uh, then uh, I, though I was doing my PhD in electrical engineering, but my uh, professor's advisor was in physics department. And uh, my office was in the physics department. And every winter, you know, three door from my office used to be uh, Stephen Hawking used to sit there. He used to come uh, to Caltech every winter and he used to sit there. And, you know, can you imagine, you know, sitting almost next to uh, Stephen Hawking every day and I used to talk to him and many other professors from Caltech used to come and meet him. Uh, one of them was, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne got Nobel Prize for, you know, discovering the gravitational waves uh, in uh, 2017. So I came to know all these, uh, you know, very famous physics professors. And when I was finishing up my PhD, then I one day I got a call from NASA uh, saying that, uh, they uh, have seen my paper, they've read my papers, they know about me and they wanted uh, uh, to hire me so if I'm interested. Luckily, at that time, there was no video phone. Otherwise, they'd have seen me that I jumped up and said, oh, of course, I will. Uh, so I uh, accepted that offer and that's how I landed up in NASA. And I'm really, I feel like a kid in a toy store. Every day I'm excited because we are doing so many new and innovative things 
uh, you know, to solve some of these problems. That is really exciting. And also, when you are working with people who are much smarter than you, and that makes you more, smart, you know, uh, better. So that's why I'm very excited uh, to work here. Uh, and I, as for you to mention about ISRO, ISRO is also a great, great place. You all know that we are doing great stuff in ISRO, the uh, Mangalayan mission, the Chandrayan mission. Uh, so a lot of great, good things are going on. So you should, uh, you know, if you are excited about space technology, space science, you should certainly look at ISRO, NASA, and other uh, space research organizations, as well as nowadays a lot of companies are coming up, you know, SpaceX, you know, uh, you know, uh, then uh, Blue Origin, and, you know, many other companies are working in uh, space as well. Very inspiring, sir. Thank you. Uh, our next question uh, will be from Mayur Sevak, sir. Uh, is Terra's frequency will be useful for medical diagnosis in future? Uh, answer is yes. People actually are using terahertz uh, technologies to do a lot of, because as, as I mentioned, it can be, uh, it cannot penetrate too much inside your body. However, for skin cancers and uh, and also some, you know, uh, some kind of cancer, breast cancers, as well as, you know, tooth, uh, you know, decays. So this lot of people are working in the terahertz frequencies for medical applications. Okay, sir. So next question is from Charmi Zala. Uh, we have very advanced technology. Can't we use technology like endoscopy, which is used to take photo inside human body? In the same way, we can have photo of the inside Mars crust to detect water. Okay, yes, you can do. But problem is that, you know, uh, under the, uh, you have to first drill a hole, right? Because endoscopy, uh, it is done, it is very uh, fragile instrument. And then you cannot really, uh, you know, send an, first you have to drill a hole and then put an endoscopy, a endoscope to actually find out. But again, then you image, you'll be not image a lot of places because, you know, this is optical image under mud. If you put an endoscope, how much you're going to see? Not much, right? So what we are trying to do is we are trying to use a, a GPR, what is ground penetrating radar to see uh, that is there uh, in, in water and other stuff, what is underneath uh, the surface. So radar is actually a better option to do this kind of uh, work. Question from DT. That, uh, how do we know that uh, it is uh, water and not anything else from such a large distance? Oh, yes. So very good question. How we actually detect it? That is the question. Uh, we detect it through spectroscopy. Uh, spectroscopy is that when you, you know, some of you have done your high school or in your college, some experiments with spectroscopy that every material, every, um, you know, either a, an atom or some molecules, they have a spectroscopic signature if the uh, molecule is polar molecule. Then you will find this called, called rotational spectroscopy. So which means that there is a specific frequency associated with that molecule. Same is true for water. So water has a lot of spectroscopic signatures at different frequencies. One of the very important line for water is actually 557 gigahertz. I mentioned that different kinds of water that this 557 gigahertz is the strongest water line and that is for H216O. So what we do is that when you are doing spectroscopy, we know we look at the frequency and we know what we are looking at, what material we are looking at, looking at the spectroscopic signature. So that's how we know this is water and not something else. And what kind of, even what kind of water, because H216O is 557 gigahertz, HDO is actually 509 gigahertz. So by looking at all these, if you see a signature at 509 gigahertz, it has to be HDO because you know it doesn't really overlap with other materials. So each it's very unique signature of, uh, of uh, that's why we do very high resolution spectroscopy. Okay, sir. Sir, so the next. So the next question is, please tell us about M drive engine. I did not hear the question. Can you repeat it? Sir, please tell something about M drive engine. 
M drive engine. Yes, sir. I actually don't know about M drive in, uh, engine. Real sorry. Uh, I have a quick question for you. My name is Antra. I'm from Penn State University Park. Uh, mm -hmm. When you talked about the uh, helicopter, I thought the difference between perseverance and curiosity was the helicopter because most of the wheels got damaged. But you said the path is decide for, decided from Earth. So then there, there was no need for the helicopter because I thought that gave it like an aerial view, which could help the rover move accordingly and not like wear and tear. Uh, so, OK, it's a very good question. You know, one of the things that you mentioned about the wheels got damaged. It is true. Curiosity, uh, we found that because Mars is a very harsh environment and there's a lot of boulders and all, so that, that some of the wheels really got, got damaged. But that is not the main difference between the curiosity and the, and the perseverance, because perseverance is very much like curiosity with some advanced, advanced technologies, advanced next generation of instruments uh, and stuff like that. But this helicopter is in addition, because as, you, as, as I said that, the rover can go only a limited amount of space uh, places because it, it 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 doesn't move very fast. It is slow, and also we'll have to really map out that area uh, very well from other means like uh, MRO, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and other uh, other Mars uh, you know uh, assets that we have, and then we send instructions to the rover the where to go. What idea of the uh, helicopter ingenuity is that it will give us additional, you know, sets of eyes and sensors to tell, you know, give you a better understanding of the terrain, what is going on. And maybe also when we look at that at planet sitting here, we'll be able to see where those boulders are, which path to take, what to avoid, and also where are more interesting things are, right? So this will have an added advantage to the rover. The rover is, has to go and do the experiment because there is no uh, you know, equipment on the helicopter to do these experiments. The, what the helicopter is going to do is called something called reconnaissance. So it is to go and see around and send the data back. So that is the main uh, objective of this. So it, the main objective, what you're trying to say, is that it gives you an extra set of eyes so that it could uh, 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 like do the experiments accordingly and not make mistakes. That's right. So actually, it will be able to take more intelligent decisions as well as we'll be able to make more intelligent decisions sitting here. But you said there is a time lag of eight minutes. So that's right. So, but you know, that? what happens is that when the when you get the data back and the rover is there, the rover is stationary. And then we get all the data back. We realize, okay, what, what are the interesting places? Then we can chart out a path for the rover and we send the information, upload that all the instructions to the rover that, okay, make a uh, right turn after going these many meters, then make a left turn and then you can reach a certain point and then you can dig out and take the material, do a mass, mass spectroscopy, right? So those things can be done. So we cannot do, you know, kind of what is called online driving that we cannot do. However, we can actually send the instructions beforehand, upload it to the rover, and then the rover will do things. So that's how it is done. So it is uploaded on like a daily or like a... Uh, not really daily basis. We, we take decisions on, uh, again, daily in Mars daily or Earth daily because, you know, Mars uh, days are different than Earth's day. So we take, uh, we plan it out in advance. We do not always do daily uh, because you know that because the robot has to go there, do the experiment and collect the data, send the data back, and then we decide, uh, you know, we have some plan beforehand, but we can change that. Generally, we don't do daily in, in, a, couple of, in a couple of days time, generally. Okay, so next question is from Hare Krishna Nair. Uh, can plasma propulsion technology or ionization propulsion technology reduce the time span for interplanetary exploration? It's a very good question. Is because you know, as you all know, that currently uh, the technology that you use for propulsion is chemical uh, uh, propulsion technology. However, we are actually we have invested really heavily on electric propulsion, 
and 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 plasma propulsion as well. So look uh, to see that not only uh, it's about speed up, but you know it might not speed up as much. It will take time, but it will also save fuel, which means that it will, will be able to go further. So some of these we are very much looking into that. With some of these missions we are planning out using electro, electric uh, uh, propulsion technology. So that is a very interesting area of research. Okay, sir. So the next question is from Shivam Patel. If the radars are sending signals in continuous uh, continuation manner, that is, its frequency changes with time, sending signals are having larger wavelength than the reflected one. Then does Doppler effect deal with it? Uh, yes, that, that's a very good question. Uh, because what happens is, if suppose the target is stationary, then there is no Doppler effect, right? Because when you send an FMCW signal, that uh, the signal goes there and it comes back because the signal, the kind of, as a function of time and the frequency, the same kind of envelope that comes back with a delay. However, if the object is moving, right? So then what happens is that there is a Doppler effect. So if you see that when I showed you uh, uh, the signal that we are sending, transmitting, it was kind of a, 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 a triangular shape. It is not a linear sawtooth, right? It is going up, coming down, going up, coming down. The reason we do a more of a triangular shape is because to take into the Doppler effect. Because if something is moving, and then when you chart up and chart down, you'll be able to get the Doppler information, and then you know correct for this and make an image of a moving object. So it's just a very good question that yes, we do take into account the Doppler. Good morning. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, it's not morning here for me. It's actually 10.30 in the night, but that's fine. Go ahead, please. OK, uh, sir. Hello, sir. So our next question is from Utkarsh Dave. Uh, which Terrace generation method are you planning to use for Comet mission, as it has to be very small? Yes. A very good question. What we do is we use a uh, frequency uh, multiplication technique. So what uh, we start with, we actually developed a very low power uh, CMOS based synthesizer that works at W band, that is 100 gigahertz range. Uh, that's and it takes only that synthesizer draws only about you know uh, 250 milliwatt of power, and then from 100 gigahertz we use a short key diode based frequency multipliers that multiplies the signal. And we use a subharmonic mixer. That means that we go from, you know, 100 gigahertz to about 300 gigahertz, that 90, uh, and use a frequency tripler. And then we use a subharmonic mixer. So as a result, overall power requirement of that, we can actually do the entire instrument about five to six watts of power. Uh, because we actually made a lot of progress over the years, uh, the synthesizer power going down to 250 uh, milliwatt because of this new, this is the iPhone technology that we are using. So that made this difference. And that's why you can make an entire spectrometer instrument with about five to six watts. Sir, how many more questions can we allot? Because the questions will never end and we have a time <laughs> and you know one of the reason i actually kept a lot of time for this because i know my experience has been that questions keep coming so i uh, what the time for me is about 10 30 in the night so maybe uh, 10 25 so maybe five more minutes because okay. i have a early morning meeting tomorrow okay sir we'll end up in two questions now sure Okay, sir. So the next question is from Kruti Kamdar. Uh, apologies for a question outside terahertz domain. If universe is 13.2 billion years old, how is the current observable universe 54 billion years wide? So, you know, the thing is that this is expanding universe, right? The As we, as we say that ever expanding universe is actually uh, moving away from us. And then 
uh, if you look about the theory of these, that we cannot really ac uh, account for all the material that we have in the universe is about the 4% of the total mass of this universe. And which means there is some, this dark energy and dark, uh, you know, matter stuff. And where, what we are finding is that this universe, as we, uh, what I said is actually ever expanding universe and actually accelerating universe. And if you look at the theory of gravity, uh, then you would have thought that universe would have uh, you know, slowed down, that the expansion would have slowed down, right? Uh, because of the gravity pool. But we are finding that is actually accelerating. And that's why this theory of you know, dark matter and in, you know, uh, dark energy comes in. So as, as we said that uh, universe was created, Big Bang happened is 13.85 billion years ago. But in the expanse of the universe, because of this is going away, and that's why it uh, it is what uh, what it is. Okay, so our next question is from Vikas Yadav. Uh, what are your um, views regarding recent achievement on proof of gravitational waves by LIGO and MIT, and what they uh, what this achievement really mean to common people? Okay. This is actually a very, very, because, you know, for, for what the, how it was detailed, you all know that gravitational waves uh, are created, you know, in the, it can be created in many ways. One is the, uh, when the Big Bang happened, then scientists believe that the gravitational waves were created, some gravitational waves were created. So we are trying to detect that. However, the one that was detected, to which got the Nobel for Kip Thorne and others to the LIGO project, they got the Nobel Prize, was when two black holes collided, then they created this, uh, this gravitational wave. And what is the use of this wave for normal people like you and I? If you think about it, gravitational wave is the only wave that actually goes through everything. You all know that, you know, sound wave, electromagnetic wave does not go through everything. If you put a metal barrier, electromagnetic wave, if you put in a Faraday cage, your cell phone is not going to work. Your mobile phone is not going to work because you know electromagnetic waves cannot go through that metal barrier, right? So uh, same is true for uh, your uh, these sound waves. If you put uh, put yourself in a in a glass room, people cannot hear you. So that is not the case for gravitational waves. Gravitational wave goes through everything. So. What will be that used for? We still don't know, but people, scientists have been thinking about it, you know, that maybe if something, some wave that goes through everything, that how can you utilize it? So sometimes the utilization of these new science discoveries, it takes some time. For when the apple fell in front of Newton, we did not really think what that theory of gravitation will do to us and look at us today. We all this, you know, satellite communication and everything that is happening. If Newton did not, the, the apple did not fall in front of Newton and he did not come up with that theory, we would not have been able to do that. So, you know, give some time and see what uh, like people like you, I and all of us and all the next generation we can come up with. Thank you, sir. For the participants, we have something interesting now. We will be having a quiz for just five minutes. So you will have the link in your chat box. All the participants are informed that we will be having quiz after all the six sessions and the top two winners will get some cash prizes. So all the participants are now requested to connect through the link and answer as soon as possible. You will be having five minutes from now. So, okay, so I can then uh, log out, right? So, just one minute. Okay. I request Galo Bhatt for the ending remarks. So, I would like to thank Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay, sir, for giving his valuable time to deliver a great session on terahertz radar technology. I am sure it would help many of us present here in our upcoming future endeavors. Further, I would like to thank Principal Dr. Indrajit Patel, sir, for gracing the inaugural ceremony of virtual visit on Modern Physics 2020. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Jagdish Rathor sir and Dr. Darsun Dalwari sir 
for giving us an opportunity to to be the part of this great initiative under npss student chapter i triple e bvmsb additionally i would like to thank dr tanmay power sir and ecrisat faculty core committee to motivate us for the event further i would like to invite all the attendees to enhance their knowledge via session 3 of ecrisat by dr sirin takine today 3 pm as well as second session of virtual visit on modern physics 2020 by dr arvin k singh tomorrow at 11:30 am thank you thank you so much sir it was our pleasure and it was very intriguing and engaging as well thank you so much thank you thank you very much and i really wish you all a great success you guys are amazing you know i uh, galav he actually uh, uh, wrote to me and he has been writing to me on a regular basis and you guys are really amazing you are doing great job thank you thank you very much and again i want to wish you all uh, uh, on the teachers day thank you. thank you and you have a great day thank you sir thank you thank you sir okay bye have a good day have a good day sir bye sir